Hello, this is the second lecture in the AD400 Project Management and Software Development class. Today we're going to be taking a look at process models. This video shouldn't be uh, as long as some of the others, but it definitely has some very important information, so you'll want to pay close attention. So what we have here is our generic process model, and we talked about this in our last video. Uh, the generic stages are for the process model are communication planning, modeling, construction, and deployment. Um, we talked also about how following this plan sequentially really isn't a reasonable way of, of um, developing software these days because of the nature of the changes to the software are going to make it so that we have to revisit these stages and, and take a more iterative approach. But this gives us a generic idea of what the process model looks like. Over here we have a graphic that's basically showing us how uh, the software process has software frame, uh, process framework as well as umbrella activities within each one uh, which can be broken down into task sets which we'll talk about here soon and each one of those tasks that has work tasks, work, work products, uh, quality assurance points and project milestones uh, and these are just basically uh, different uh, action items that we'll talk about for each one of the task sets and we'll talk about what task sets here in a minute. <clears throat> Alright, so let's walk through some process flows. Our first one is our linear process flow. Uh, this is the old style of um, developing software. Notoriously found problems when there was any changes that had to happen to the software. So we're sequentially going through each stage. We're not backtracking. We're not iterating. Once we're done with deployment, we put the product out into production and we're done. Right? Not a great model to be using. Iterative process flow is a little better. This gives us the ability to revisit some of our stages. So here you can see after planning, we revisited back to the beginning and went through communication again. Uh, modeling seems to iterate upon itself. And after construction here, we iterated back to the beginning. Uh, perhaps there was something that we had to add, features that changed, whatever was necessary. All right, and we're getting a little better here now. We can see the evolutionary process flow where we actually do sequentially follow the steps all the way through, but instead of producing a product into production and being done and then having to deal with 7 million thousand bugs, uh, we, which you don't have to deal with anyway, but um, after deployment, we increment, a re a, we release an increment, which is basically like a version of our product. And then we go back to the drawing board and what features do we need to change? What and, and how do we do that? And how do we model it? And then we construct it and deploy it and then release another version. And then we keep going and going and going. And it just, the product begins to evolve and evolve and evolve until the final release happens. And then the parallel process flow where we see that there are different stages that are actually operating in parallel. This is probably the most agile version of this. So you can see communication and planning are happening simultaneous to modeling. Uh, and so there's poss possibly multiple teams that are operating on this at the same time. Um, you can also see that some construction is being done uh, during the uh, planning phase. So uh, there's a, a simultaneous amount of work being done by multiple teams. All right. So a task set is going to be any sort of work that needs to be done to accomplish our objectives in our software engineering uh, processor actions. And let's talk a little bit about the lists that are created from a task set. Our first one is going to be a list of tasks that can be accomplished. And this includes individual tasks and activities that need to be completed to achieve the project's objectives. These tasks should be specific, actionable, and time bound. The process of creating this list involves decomposing the project into smaller, more manageable units of work. Each task should be well defined and clear start and endpoints need to be uh, established as well. Um, this also needs to be assigned to the appropriate team members uh, and basically this list is going to become a roadmap for the project's execution. 
Next, we have a list of work products to be produced. So work products refers to the tangible outputs that are created as a result of completing the tasks. They could be documents, code, designs, prototypes, test cases, user manuals, what, uh, whatever else could be included in that. For each task, it is essential to identify the corresponding work products that need to be generated. This ensures that the project progress is tangible, measurable, and aligns with the overall objectives. And finally, we have our list of quality assurance filters to be applied. So quality assurance, as we talked about before, is absolutely essential to producing a reliable and high quality product. So this list is going to outline all the various quality assurance measures, processes, and checks that will be applied to ensure that the work product meets specific standards. Uh, some of these filters may include code reviews, testing procedures, uh, user acceptance testing, performance testing, security audits, um, lots of stuff that we'll talk about later as well as next quarter. Um, they're going to act as gateways that work products must pass through to be considered ready for delivery. Um, they're going to help prevent uh, any sort of defects from getting into the production level process. Although, of course, there's always going to be things that slip through the cracks. Okay, so uh, software assessment and improvement is, um, we have to definitely be assessing our software to ensure that it meets whatever criteria that we're looking for. We're going to be using lots of different metrics and analytics. Some of those measurements we'll be taking a look at this quarter later. Um, we definitely want to be constantly monitoring our process to ensure that it's meeting the standards that we're, that our stakeholders are looking for. Our customers are happy, our boss is happy, our scrum master is happy, everyone's happy, right? And we'll talk about these later, as it says here. All right, so we're going to talk about some prescriptive process models. Um, and they're going to give us an orderly approach to a lot of the software engineering. Uh, what some of the things that we want to consider, though, with these prescriptive models is if they strive for structure and order, is it appropriate for software that thrives uh, on change? Like I said, software in this modern age is constantly being changed and updated. And so these prescriptive models are very orderly, and, and some of them can be very rigid, as we'll see. Um, but some of them are actually designed to accommodate change. Um, and then if we reject the traditional process models and replace them with something less structured, does this make it uh, impossible to achieve coordination, coherence, and software work, right? So basically the idea is we don't want to go from one extreme or the other, right? We want structure, but we want uh, flexibility. We want agility, right? So let's take a look at some of these. The first one is the notorious waterfall process model. Um, and these are the stages we have communication, um, where in this stage, the project stakeholders, including clients, users, development team, communicate, gather information about the project's requirements and goals to try to understand the project, uh, the problem domain. Planning is when after we've gathered the requirements, we begin planning, creating a detailed project plan, includes determining the scope of the project, creating a schedule, allocating resources. And then we move into the modeling phase. Uh, where the software's high-level architecture and design are created based on the requirements that we gathered. Um, this also includes creating des uh, detailed design documentation, data models, and systems architecture. Construction is where we actually do the coding and the development. Uh, we take the designs that were given and we implement the software using good coding standards and then in deployment um, after we finish construction it's thoroughly tested to identify or any fix any defects once it's been approved by quality assurance it's deployed to our production environment so one of the some of the key characteristics of the software model is it is sequential all the processes uh, all the stages happen in a linear manner each stage must be completed before moving on to the next one. It's driven by documents, so we want to create comprehensive documentation at each stage to guide uh, the subsequent phases. Uh, it is not flexible. It's not adaptable to change. I, I think I kind of 
beat that dead horse already. Uh, and it's uh, limited user involvement. So the idea here is that we get the user's information and communication. We talk to them. What do you want? How do you want it? Blah, blah, blah. Right. But we don't talk to them anymore after that. We're doing our planning. We're doing our modeling, construction. Um, and, uh, and, and then we just keep going. Some of the pros of this, it's well easy to understand. It's good for small projects. Analysis tests straightforward. Everything uh, keeps, it, keeps it simple. Uh, unfortunately, it does not accommodate change well. Um, testing occurs very late in the process. So if there's any bugs, they get found out much later. Uh, and that could be a problem because there may be something that was modeled incorrectly. And so if we're testing only in the end, we have to actually go back to modeling. And the software, or the, the purest form of a waterfall process is not going to allow us to do that. Uh, and then the customer approval is at the end. Gosh forbid that they really don't like it, and then we have to start the whole process over again, which ends up being an iterative process model, kind of defeating the whole purpose of the waterfall process model. Definitely not one that is in high regard these days. Um, it can be used for small projects, uh, but yeah, it's not really considered to be a viable option these days. Another model is the prototyping process model, which is an iterative and incremental approach, incremental approach to the software development that emphasizes quick and tangible prototypes of the software to get feedback and refine requirements. Um, it's really good when the uh, project requirements are not well defined or when the stakeholders are uncertain about their exact needs. Um, so we start with communication. Uh, talking to the stakeholders. A lot of these uh, uh, stages are the same, so I'm not going to just keep re repeating myself. Uh, communication is pretty much the same. Then we have a quick plan where we uh, quick plan is uh, created to outline the high level objective scope constraints of the project. Um, plan helps the key the team establish the groundwork for the prototyping process, identifying key features and functionalities. So the idea here is that we don't want to plan everything. We just want to plan enough to be able to get a prototype in place. And then we're going to do a quick design, right? So we get a quick and rough design of the uh, product uh, and it's not fully detailed. And then we get into the construction. So with a quick design in hand, we're going to just construct a functional prototype of the product, focusing on implementing our essential features and functionalities. Once it's constructed, we deploy it uh, to the and deliver it to the stakeholders, right? And we say, here, this is what we created. Here's our prototype. What do you think, right? Um, it reminds me of how in video games, you know, they have like a beta version. They give it to the customers. Customers complain, tell them all the terrible things that are wrong with it or all the things that they like. And then they're able to go back into communication stage and they're able to start the process again, iteratively creating more prototypes until they get to a point. And that's the question. Like, when do you get to a point where you've got that final release and it's put into production? Well, when you know that's it's an ambiguous it's an ambiguous question right it's an ambiguous answer you really it depends on the project manager and the people who are interested uh at giving you the thumbs up on this looks like a final product for us pros uh we don't really have a big issue with requirement changes the customers involved early they're often works well for small projects um, and we don't have to really to face project rejection as much uh, unfortunately, the customer involvement may cause delays. Gosh forbid, yeah, like you're going to get the customer in there and they're going to be picky and you're going to be giving them lots of prototypes. So they're going to see them and they're going to want this change and that change and oh, I would like this feature and oh, wouldn't it be cool if we did this and blah, 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 blah. And they create this scope bloat, right, or feature bloat that causes the, the uh, length of the project to grow. So that can be a problem. Um, you get to a point where you're temptation to ship a prototype um, there's a little bit of work that's lost in the throwaway prototype. I guess this is kind of up for debate because the actual prototype that you're doing is a process of iteration where you're developing this thing and you're making it better. So I'm not really sure if it's like work lost, but, um, and it can be hard to plan and manage at least more so than waterfall. All right. So our next model is going to be our, oh, I went too far. Oh, did I go too far? Okay. Oops. All right. 
We're going to be our unified process model, also known as the unified software development process or simply unified process. Um, iterative and incremental software development methodology breaks the framework. Uh, it is a process framework that guides the development of the software systems by breaking the development life cycle into a series of phases or iterations. And it's based really on the unified modeling language UML, which we're going to explore later. So uh, communication is pretty much the same, talking to stakeholders, gathering requirements. In our planning stages, uh, we're going to have a detailed project created. Uh, defines a project scope, objectives, deliverables. It also identifies key features and functionalities that will be de developed in the software. Notice how communication and planning are now kind of grouped together into the inception stage. Uh, and then and we have an elaboration stage, um, which is involving our planning and our um, modeling. So with our modeling, we're going to do, you know, develop the architecture and the design based on our requirements. Particularly, this one is useful with UML diagrams to visualize and document the system structure, behavior, and interactions. Uh, construction happens next, where we actually implement the software based on the design and the models created. Uh, and then we have the transition phase, which is construction and deployment, where after construction, where the software is tested, final product is deployed to the target environment. Um, lots of different forms of testing is done and then we do a release right where we we go into iteration so here's our first release here's our first version uh, the software increment represents a portion of the complete system with added and improved functionalities from the previous increment after each iteration release of the software increment is made available for evaluation and feedback. So this model is characterized by its iterative and incremental nature, allows it more flexibility and adaptability. Um, instead of attempting to get all the requirements to design up front, it focuses on delivering value to the stakeholders through regular releases of functional increments, which is interesting because it kind of sounds like the prototype version, right? Except here, we're actually taking and we're delivering a model uh, it is very similar to the prototype version, um, except it's more detailed in its planning and its modeling. Uh, we're not only focused on getting that prototype done for each session. We're actually, uh, for each iteration, we're actually going a little deeper with each thing. Also focuses heavily on visual modeling techniques such as UML to communicate with the stakeholders as well as all the stakeholders to understand everybody's on the same page. Some of the pros are we have quality documentation, uh, the customer's constantly involved, good and bad, right? Uh, accommodating requirement changes. Um, one second. Uh, and then it works well for maintenance projects. So if you have a project that's developing or actually performing just uh, software maintenance, this works really well. Um, use cases are not always precise in this particular situation. Uh, we'll learn more about use cases later. Um, it can be tricky to uh, do these software increments. Overlapping phases can cause problems. Notice how there are overlapping phases here, like, uh, for example, with planning and modeling under elaboration. And really, this requires an expert development team. And as we're going to see, there's other models that we're going to go through that also require this expert development team. You don't want a bunch of interns that are going in trying to do this because it's going to get more messy. It's rather complicated. All right, so our spiral process model or evolutionary model is a risk-driven iterative software development model that combines the elements of both iterative development and the waterfall model. So it's addressing risks early in the development process by continually evaluating and refining the project through iterative cycles. So we have our standard stages here with communication, talking to our stakeholders, identifying their needs, creating goals, constraints, and then we go into our planning stage uh, where we're created based on the requirements gathered, outlines the project scope, the deliverables, all the schedule. Um, here we also want to really focus on potential risks and mitigation strategies, identify them, put them in the plan. Modeling is our analysis and our design uh, that we'll be doing. It may involve creating prototypes or mockups to visualize the system's functionality. In construction, we're going to start coding, creating, and then testing, uh, and then deployment. Uh, once it's thoroughly tested, the final product is deployed to the target environment. 
user acceptance tests may take place to ensure the project meets the stakeholder's requirement. It's really important to understand that the spiral process model is characterized by also its iterative nature. After the initial deployment, the development process doesn't end. Instead, it enters into another iteration, revisiting the stages in a continuous loop to address new requirements, gather feedback, and improve the software based on the lessons learned from the previous iterations. You know, and sometimes, you know, you, you get these... Um, you get these spiral process models where you're able to, you know, create this um, software, put it out there, and it, um, and it's just a continuous process, right? Until you meet all the requirements, and then it's a continuous process of fixing the bugs. And this is not a surprise. We've seen this before in the last couple models. Um, here, there's more of a focus. Uh, on making sure that risks are identified uh, and that risks are handled, um, whereas the prototype was all about getting a prototype out to the user, uh, and the um, unified process model was we actually had a series of overlapping stages. So there's distinctions between these, but there's a lot of similarities as well. The idea is that you know, we're taking that waterfall and we're making it more iterative with our spiral process model um, where we get the benefits of really having a robust and structured format for what we're doing, but we're also making it iterative. Again, customers involved a lot here. Development risks are managed, um, suitable for large complex projects. Our iterative structured approach allows us to keep iterating finding more risks, finding more requirements that need to be implemented. Uh, and it works well for extensible project products, that is products that would have some sort of development or iteration on them later after requirements have been met. Um, so risk analysis failures can doom the project. Uh, so if there's any sort of uh, analysis around risk and that we're unable to um, handle that risk or account for it uh, can doom the entire project. It can be hard to manage. And again, we need an expert development team on this one. OK, so some other models that exist are uh, the rapid application development model, which is an iterative development and proto model with prototyping and little planning involved. So you develop uh, functional models in parallel for faster product delivery. You have a business modeling, data modeling, process modeling, application generation, and then testing and turnover, right? And then that's it, right? This is a really fast way of getting this done and put out there. Um, it focuses on gathering requirements using focus groups and workshops, reusing software components and informal communication. So finally, the agile model I'm just gonna talk about uh, it encourages continuous iterations of development and testing. Each incremental part is developed over an iteration. Each iteration is designed to be small and manageable so it can be completed within a few weeks, which we call sprints, which we're going to learn about in the next video. So each iteration focuses on implementing a small set of features completely. It involves customers in the development process and minimizes documentation by using informal communication. Agile development really considers this. Requirements are assumed to be changed. Okay? The system evolves over a series of short iterations, customers are involved, and documentation is done only when needed. So our Agile model is really not going to be focusing as much on documentation such as with the unified process model where we were documenting heavily. Um, here we're documenting lightly uh, and uh, only done when needed. That being said, there is a difference between agile pro, uh, project management and agile software engineering, whereas in agile project management, documentation may make a, take a more central role, whereas in agile software engineering, um, the software engineers are actually not going to be documenting as much. Um, OK, so that is it for this lecture the only thing i just put this slide here at the end because we want to think about these questions again now that we've seen these prescriptive models so i'll leave that to you and i'll see you in the next video